some places in the Pali Canon where the Buddha says the five aggregates of suffering. There are others where he says the five clinging aggregates are suffering. It's important that you notice that he's talking about two different kinds of suffering, two different kinds of stress. The sense in which the five aggregates are suffering is related to suffering in terms of the three characteristics. They're inconstant, and so they, they're stressful. That's simply the way they are. Whether you hold on to them or not, that's simply the way they are. There's stress in those things. But if you don't grab onto these things, your mind doesn't suffer. It's when you grab on. It's when you cling. That's when suffering comes into the mind. You create a connection. And this is suffering in terms of the Four Noble Truths. Wherever there's craving, there can be clinging. And the clinging to the aggregates is a suffering that really weighs on the mind. And so when we practice, our main focus is the suffering the Four Noble Truths, the suffering that weighs on the mind, the stress that weighs on the mind. If we don't cling to things that are stressful, then they can be stressful as much as they want, but it doesn't come in and weigh us down. It's like picking up a heavy object. If you just leave it there on the ground, it's not doesn't weigh you down. It can be just weigh just as much whether you're picking up picking it up or not. When you pick it up, it's fifty pounds. When you leave it on the ground, it's fifty pounds. The difference is that the fifty pounds is suddenly on top of you when you pick it up. And that's when you suffer. And that's precisely the suffering the Buddha is really focusing on. That's the important one to notice. So always try to be clear on that distinction. It's the clinging that's the problem. And the word clinging, it turns out, has a double meaning. It could also mean that you feed on something. This is where we look to, to feed on for happiness. We look to the five aggregates and we munch them down. This body of ours, this form, we feed on the form, we feed on the feelings. And when the feelings are pleasant, that's not too bad. But they can turn around and turn unpleasant very quickly. Feelings in the same body. If you're clinging to the body, clinging to the feelings, then once you start clinging to the good ones, you start clinging to the bad ones as well. Because that's where you're looking for food. Feelings, perceptions, thought constructs. Even the act of sensory consciousness, we feed on these things. And as a result, we cling. And when we cling, we're weighed down. So it's important that you understand clinging. And as the Buddha said, there are four kinds. There's sensual clinging, there's clinging to views, clinging to precepts and practices, and then clinging to doctrines of the self. All of these hover around the five aggregates, different ways that you cling to the five aggregates. And the Buddha's medicine for each of, these, each of these four kinds of clinging differs. Sometimes you hear that, well, the most basic form of clinging, the deepest form of clinging, is your sense of identity that you build around things. So learn how not to have any sense of self-identity, and there you are, you've taken care of all the other ones. Or sometimes you hear that clinging to views is the basic form of clinging. And so you develop the view that you can't say that things exist, you can't say things that don't exist, you say that they're empty. Then you realize that your sensual desire is empty, your precepts and practices are empty, your doctrines of the self are empty. With everything empty like that, there's nothing to cling to. But that doesn't work either. 
you have to realize each kind of clinging has its own antidote. For example, clinging to sensuality. When the Buddha talks about sensuality, he doesn't say that you're attached to sights or sounds. The word gamma here does not mean sights or sen sounds, taste, touch, or sensations, or whatever. It doesn't refer to the fact that these things are beautiful or desirable. It refers to the fact that you have intentions aimed at these things, and you're attached to your intentions. That's what you're really focused on. We're attached to the idea of wanting things, wanting to make things be a certain way to give us pleasure. In other words, we're more attached to our dreams about sensuality or sensual pleasures than we are to the sensual pleasures themselves. This is simple enough to see. If you find your sensual desire thwarted in one area, you turn around and you focus it on something else. It's the desire that we cling to. We cling to the plans that we make for sensuality. And what are these plans like? Well, they're, they're pretty one-sided and pretty sketchy. So you have designs on somebody else's body. When you think about that person's body, there are only certain details that you think about. A lot of details you don't want to think about at all. When you think about a particular relationship, you think about only certain aspects of the relationship. not about others. So the antidote here is actually to broaden your view, to see that your pursuit of pleasure in this way leads to a lot of pain. When the Buddha talks about the drawbacks of sensuality, one is in order to leave a sensual, lead a sensual lifestyle, you've got to work. And the work in and of itself is a lot of pain. You work and work and work to build up wealth and Sometimes you gain it, sometimes you don't. Even when you do gain it, then there's fear that, as he says, thieves and kings will steal it. I've always liked the way the Buddha puts thieves and kings into the same phrase. Thieves and kings might steal it, water might wash it away, fire might burn it, hateful airs could take off with it. That can happen to your wealth. And as the Buddha points out, it's over sensuality that people fight. Parents fight with their children, children fight with their parents, brothers with sisters, sisters with brothers, husband with wife. And not just in the family, there are wars over sensual pleasures as well. Because we need to take things, we need to take wealth, and the wealth of the world is not enough for our desires, we end up going to war. He goes down the list of all the pain that comes with this pursuit of our dreams of sensuality. So as you look at the pursuit of sensuality in its entirety, you realize how much pain and suffering it involves. You don't have to look too far. This contemplation we have of the requisites every day. Thinking about food, clothing, shelter, and medicine. Just the fact that we have a body requires that we become a burden on other people. So think about that. Every time your mind starts spinning a web of sensual desire, say if you're going to spin a web, spin a real web. Try to encompass the whole picture. like that daydream that a John Lee reports in his autobiography, thinking about when he was going to disrobe. And at first it starts out really nice. He even gets a nobleman's daughter for his wife. But then the reality principle starts kicking in, and eventually, because she's a nobleman's daughter, she's not up to the hard work that's required by marrying a peasant son. And she dies, leaves him with a child to raise. He gets a second wife. The second wife starts playing favorites. She has one kid and starts abusing the first kid, and so on down the line. And bringing in reality like this helps to cut through a lot of our delusions. 
around sensuality, a lot of our, our attachment to sensual designs, sensual plans, sensual dreams. You can contemplate the body in all its parts. You can think of a beautiful body, and then you think of the parts inside. Say, Oof. Just a few micrometers below the skin, there's all this other stuff. And it comes along with the things that you like. I suppose you lust for somebody. Well, you don't like the idea of their intestines, but okay, okay, would you take their intestines out? Would you like that person without having any intestines? You can't get it any either way. Without a liver, without a stomach. You have to take the whole package. So when you think in these ways, you begin to realize that these sensual plans and desires you have are really unrealistic. They're really misleading. They take you down a path to suffer. When you think about this, this is what helps cut through the sensuality. You realize how arbitrary all these dreams are. that you can't rely on them. This is what helps you let them go. So that's how the Buddha has you deal with sensual clinging. Clinging to views is a similar process. He has you look at the drawbacks that come from clinging to a view. You get in arguments with other people. But this is where he also has you look at the whole process of, okay, what are these things that you have views about? This is where he starts analyzing things in more technical terms. You have views about what exists and what doesn't exist. He says, but when you look at your sensory experience as it arises and passes away, as you focus on the arising, the idea of non-existence doesn't occur to you. When you focus on the passing away, the idea of existence doesn't occur to you. This is where the Buddha this is where the Buddha talks about abandoning polarities. And you realize that the basic building blocks of experience, when you look at them just as they arise and pass away, don't provide a foundation for these views. Again, the views are sketches that are based on not looking at things very carefully. So the Buddha has you look very carefully at the process of what it's like to experience things. And then you see that, one, given that the views really can't express the truth about things, and two, that holding on to them is going to lead you to suffer. That helps cut through your attachment to views. As for precepts and practices, one, he has you look at the actual precepts and practices you're attached to. The attachment here is the idea that if you follow certain rules and you're a good little boy and a good little girl, that's all you have to do. God will be happy with you or whatever. And so the Buddha has people look at their precepts and practices. Some are you know, actively harmful. Back in his days, the sacrifices were believed as the way to find true happiness. He's talked about looking at the misery that comes with the sacrifices. Self-torture as a form of austerity, that was a popular practice in some circles. So look at the torture, look at the pain that comes from it, and it doesn't really lead anywhere. It doesn't really help cleanse the mind. So first he had people abandon harmful practices and replace them with good precepts and good practices. The precepts we follow is part of our virtue, the practices we follow is practice of meditation. But then he says, watch out, you're going to develop a, build up a sense, create a sense of yourself around these things. The pride that comes sometimes when I follow the precepts and you don't, or I have jhana and you don't. And so the way to get beyond that attachment is not to go out and break the precepts or drop your practice of jhana. It's simply to continue with those practices, but learn how not to develop a sense of 
self around these things. Don't create or build up a sense of self around these things. Realize that you're doing them not to make yourself better than other people, but simply because they work in cleansing the mind. And then finally there's clinging to doctrines of self. This doesn't mean just just the view that I have a self or what your self might be. It also means clinging to the view that I have no self. Thinking in those terms, the Buddha said, is leads you into a thicket of views. This will get you back into that attachment of views. And as we noted there, but the issue of existence or non-existence, the Buddha has you put that polarity aside, then the idea of a self existing or not existing is a non-issue. What the Buddha has you look at instead is simply look at things in terms of the Four Noble Truths. Where is there stress? What is the cause of stress? What's the path to the end of stress? Divide up your experience in those terms, and the whole issue of who you are or who you are not just gets put aside. You're more focused on what you're doing that's causing stress. Learning how to comprehend the stress, learning how to abandon the cause through developing the path, so ultimately you can realize the end of stress, the end of suffering. That's the way out of that form of clinging. So when you find the mind clinging, weighing itself down with its attachment to the aggregates, try to be clear on exactly what kind of clinging you're suffering from and what the antidote is, what the medicine is that the Buddha prescribed. Because it's different in each case. There's no one blanket cure for clinging. You've got to develop your discernment from many angles. Develop discernment has many facets. I mean, essentially, it means seeing things in terms of being inconstant and stressful and not self. But those principles get applied in different ways for each type of clinging. So try to keep this list of medicines in mind and apply them as appropriate. So you can put yourself in a position where you're living in a world that's stressful, but you're not pulling the stress inside. You can live within constancy stress and not self, but not suffer from it. 